Hi there everyone. We have a special guest today. This is Brian McManus from the YouTube channel Real Engineering. You should check it out. We will have links. But today, you're here at the Royal Society. Mm -hmm. Now, Brian's into engineering, as you probably guessed. He's also Irish, as you will quickly guess when he starts talking. <laughs> so, Keith, Irish engineer. What'd you Irish engineer, yes. Robert Mallet, born in Dublin, very great civil engineer, but interested in things that fall apart and blow up. So I think this is your kind of territory. Yes, uh, I'm going to enjoy seeing all the, the diagrams of disasters and the forensics behind it. Well, we'll start with the printed book. This is his tract on the physical conditions involved in the construction of artillery. One of the things Mallet is interested in, and you can see the date here is 1856, is armaments and defences against armaments. So things like steel, plate, iron, plate, right. and so on. Unfortunately, most of our huge scientific advancements have come from anything related to war. It gives that driving stress for technological progress. So we've got some engravings here of cannons and the construction of artillery was very big from the 18th century into the 19th century. How do you stop them from stressing, breaking apart, blowing up when they're fired? And this is the kind of thing that uh, Mallet is writing about here. Right. He's writing about drooping in this case. Does he propose any way of improving this? I presume he's talking about the, the thickness of the actual bore and everything. Happens to one in three cannons apparently, Keith. <laughs> Does it, yeah. Brady? Yes, That's I'm what sure. They say. Yeah, so it it tells you, uh, this is plate four, illustrates the effect on brass guns. That is properly drooping, that cannon, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. It's suffering from muzzle droop by the look of this. But this one is, is drooping to an exaggerated degree, it says here. Oh, okay. Um, the gun becomes bent on precisely the pr same principle that the length of the gridiron pendulum is preserved invariable. So uh, we know about gridiron pendulums, don't we, from measurements in previous objectivities. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but this is uh, moving swiftly on. Oh, that's nice. Big brass, or big reinforcement rings on it and everything. Oh, look, we've got, we've got elephants, elephants in the, in the background. We've got elephants. Yeah. Sorry, you can see who the non-engineer here is. <laughs> You're here talking about brass rings, and I'm going, oh, look, an elephant. <laughs> so this is the credentials. He, he's mm -hmm. got credentials, but that's not really what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk mm -hmm. about a little side mission, something else that suddenly consumed Mallet. That's right. So in 1857, there was a huge earthquake in Italy, the Great Neapolitan Earthquake. Of course, this was of great interest to scientists. Mallet particularly wanted to get out there, have a look at the aftermath of the earthquake, and just see if he could apply some scientific principles to what was going on. And this is, first of all, the manuscript version of the report he wrote. So Mallet is a fellow of the Royal Society. The Royal Society gives him some money to go out there to finance his mini expedition. And this is the draft of the report he wrote on what he saw and found there. Oh, look, he did lots of crossing out and correcting. Do you do that, Brian, when you're doing your script? All the time. This is this, <laughs> this was familiar. It's really a big moment in observational seismology. He's the man on the spot. He records everything he sees. But most importantly, in the 1850s, you've got photography for the first time and landscape photographers. So he could employ people to go out in the countryside and take pictures of what had happened. All right, this sounds like the engineering stuff. Brian, you better get in there, man. <laughs> these are just a selection of the photographs and these are in the area around Naples. But here's a landscape view and you can see there's a village, a town on a hill, and you can see these huge movements of earth coming Coming down the hill there where the land has slipped and this is the kind of forces that Robert Mallet is, is very interested in. I'm presuming that's a crevice through, mm, it's difficult yeah. to tell. In a way this is something that Mallet had a solution for because this is a kind of a two-dimensional thing. What would it be like if you had a three-dimensional image of this mm -hmm. and you could tell a little bit more about the way the land has gone and indeed that's what he did. So he used stereoscopic photographs to try and capture some of that three-dimensional effect. And we have some of them just here. So there's two images which, if combined with a viewer, will fool your brain into thinking you're looking at a single three-dimensional okay. image here. And you can see there's a man here sitting on a, on it looks like a broken wall, with a building that's damaged behind him. Forensics type stuff is always fascinating. Even with planes, which would be my speciality, it's always fascinating seeing why something happened and backtracking it and figuring yeah. out like what the, the kind of stresses and forces that plane 
or building experienced. Mallet would use these to try and extract information in terms of drawings okay. and he would, he would try and draw and, and, and think about the forces concerned. So we should maybe have a look at some of his drawings. You can see these are proofs of diagrams from Mallet's report on earthquakes, part one. This is a map, this is an overview, and presumably these are lines of force, I'm guessing, are they? Seems to be. Like he seems to have drawn in where the rubble is, mm -hmm. maybe, and trying to figure out where it's fallen from in the from the buildings. So if they're fallen here and there, maybe the force kind of changed at some point during the earthquake. Mm -hmm. By figuring out yeah. why the ground was shaking. Yeah. Let me just have a look at this one. You have a view kind of similar to the one of the photographs mm -hmm. we saw where you've got a mountain town here and again he seems to be looking at a landslip or something like that or a crack maybe and i don't know if this mm -hmm. is meant to signify rubble down here as well of where yeah it looks like it's fallen it? down yeah. we've got some some buildings here and he's shown the, the cracking the in, the, in around the windows good old stress concentration imagine he would have taken this as information on how to reinforce the buildings better yeah that's really interesting Trying to figure out how that would crack like that myself. Mm, so it's cracked here, here, and at the sides, and even at the maybe at the bottom. I think this is meant to be the center of gravity or something yes. of it, and he's trying to figure out the vector of the force through it. Nearly all of this type of work is done through computer simulation. Now you could put that entire column into like some sort of simulation software and just shake it and figure out how it broke, and it would probably agree exactly with how how it actually did in real life. And that'll take like two hours. <laughs> Where's the fun in that? <laughs> This almost seems like an epicenter type thing, figuring out how bad the force was the further you got away from something. Mm -hmm. What does this make you feel looking it's at it being done old school? Uh, inadequate, I <laughs> think. <laughs> inadequate. <laughs> it's like we, we don't learn how to do these things properly anymore. We rely so much on computers and these guys were so much more ahead of their time and so much more intelligent than the average engineer these days, I think. I think engineering has become a lot more accessible to the everyday man now. What have we got here, Kay? This is what the Royal Society's money paid for. This is volume one of the report on the Neapolitan earthquake of 1857. So, nice Irish green there. Yeah. This is all of the raw material that would eventually allow Mallet to produce this study. So this oh, is yeah. uh, the city of Pola after the earthquake. Oh, wow, uh, wow. You can see he's used some of those photographs and, and taken them to the printers. So the printers have produced this rather fine lithograph of the scene. That is pretty impressive. Hmm. So you can see it's subtitled, Great Neapolitan Earthquake of 1857, but The First Principles of Observational Seismology by Robert Mallet, FRS. It's a great title. Yeah, and uh, if we flick through, you'll probably be able to see a few of those drawings reproduced. And you can see these are Whoa. taken from those photographs. There's that similar kind of sketch there. So these sketches we saw before now yeah. making their way into print. So this is the effects of shock upon buildings and the relations of floors and roofs. So this is meant to be like a cross-section looking down on, say, like I a square so. room or like something? A, yeah, yeah. All right, Brian, there we go. Robert Mallet, maybe an earthquake video on real engineering? It's coming. Everything, uh, I've had that on the list for a long while too. But now I, I have inspiration for how far back I can go. Now, one thing that's really interesting and noticeable, obviously, is how fine and detailed all the markings are. And obviously that's really, really important that the markings on the instrument itself mm are incredibly accurate. That's right. And that leads to something else you've got sitting over in the corner that's worth a look. Yeah, Edward Troughton produced a manuscript on, on how to make instruments that accurate and what he did along the way. So uh, yeah, we should maybe have a look at that.